Hello, I'm Ranger Mara at Shenandoah National Park. Today we're going to be finding out what's going on in our big meadow. This wonderful habitat includes a tremendous diversity of wildflowers and things that depend on them. So in this mid to late summer day, we're going to be seeing what's blooming, what has successfully been pollinated and has, has got some fruit, um, and what is going to seed. Right now we're standing in a patch of common milkweed. And it's a very large patch of this wonderful native flower. Um, you can see it has some unusual looking flowers on it. These are very fragrant, these pinkish white flowers on the milkweed. Um, these are nectar flowers, so a lot of pollinators like bees and, and butterflies will come to these flowers. This is an interesting plant in how it gets pollinated, however. It takes a butterfly to remove the pollen sac. This is a little tiny sac that looks like a little tiny saddlebag, and the pollen is on each side of that little saddlebag, and that's tucked down between the, the petals of the flower down here. Now, the butterfly doesn't know it when it lands on the flower. It's just there to get the nectar with its long soda straw tongue to suck that out. But when it leaves, sometimes its leg will have uh, gone down between those flower petals and uh, hooked on to that saddlebag. And when they leave, they pull it with them. And then when they go to another milkweed flower and they land on it, if they land on it just so, that little saddlebag will insert in just the right spot and pollinate the flower. So that's a pretty tricky way of getting pollinated and pretty risky, because think about how difficult it is and what the chances are of the right butterfly coming by and pulling out that pollen uh, saddlebag and placing it right in the right spot on another plant. So the chances of, of you know, one flower getting pollinated on here are not that high. And so um, milkweed compensates by having a lot of flowers. So it's got lots of chances for that pollen sac to get moved. Um, but you can see on some of these surrounding milkweed uh, plants what the percentage is of flowers to seeds that have been uh, 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 fertilized on here. So you see here was a whole head of flowers and just a few little seed pods starting to form. So just four or five of the flowers got pollinated in this bunch right here. There's a bunch here and there's just one um, little, little seed pod forming there. So um, pretty good strategy if you have a pretty tricky uh, pollination mechanism to have as many flowers as you can. And then as the flowers uh, uh, the pollination goes on, or I should say after the flowers are pollinated, the seeds begin to grow and now you're starting to see this, this nice bumpy big seed pod that's so uh, uh, typical of the common milkweed uh, flowers. These will get bigger, get to be about two or three times this big, and they'll be full of seeds. And in about late September, October, those will have turned brown, the outsides will dry, crack open, and then the wind will just tug out the seeds that are attached to fluffy, like we called them Santa Clauses when I was kids. They look like dandelion fluff. And those seeds are attached to a little bit of fluff and they'll just kind of dance out there on the wind and get deposited somewhere else. So it's a pretty interesting pollination scheme for, for the common milkweed. All right, we're looking at some native goldenrod here. It's just starting to bloom in mid-August, and we have several different species of goldenrods in the meadow. It's a beautiful flower with the little yellow flowers, lots of them, and they will attract pollinators as well. Sometimes people are uh, sort of uh, afraid of goldenrods because they fear that goldenrod uh, gives them allergies, the, the pollen from the goldenrod. But actually the pollen in goldenrod is not windborne. Windborne pollens are the ones that come up our noses and, and make us sneeze and, and give us our, our allergies. But goldenrod holds on to its pollen because it wants to attract pollinators like bees to come and collect it. Um, what it really is, is giving us these uh, late summer um, allergies is the sneaky little plant coming up behind the goldenrod, and that's these guys. This is ragweed. Ragweed is inconspicuous. It's got little tiny flowers and they stay sort of green, so they're hard to, to see. They don't stand out, but they're right mixed in there with the goldenrods, and so the um, 
ragweed pollen is wind pollinated. So it lifts off of the, the flower and it, it's carried in the wind and it's kind of like a lot of grasses that have their pollen carried by the wind. Um, and so that's where we're getting our allergic reactions to this little guy that's inconspicuous and not this beautiful goldenrod plant. So if you're having fall allergies, uh, try not to blame the goldenrod. That's the ragweed. They're both native plants. They both belong in this uh, wonderful ecosystem, but some of them have a little bit more of an effect on us than, uh, than others do. We have two beautiful non-native plants here that are common in meadows. These are uh, plants that came from Europe. Uh, the one on my left is Queen Anne's Lace right here with a flat cluster of little white flowers. The leaves are very narrow and kind of, kind of skeleton-y looking. And to my right is Yarrow, and this has more of a feathery leaf uh, to it. Um, even though these are non-native, they're not invasive. They're part of the, the tapestry that makes up this wonderfully diverse um, meadow um, uh, uh, scene that we have here. And they're also important to pollinators and other animals that, uh, that uh, move around our meadow. Um, the, the difference is uh, yarrow, they both have little white flowers, but yarrow is a member of the composite family, like our daisies, dandelions, things like that. And Queen Anne's Lace is a member of the parsley family. So um, two different families with sort of similar flowers, just that they're small and white. But if you look closely at them, you'll notice they're, they're quite different. Um, what people notice most about yarrow is their leaves. And in the springtime, um, before these flowers come up, these are summertime flowers, people just see the leaves and they'll ask us, what is that, what is that fern that's coming up out of the ground, and it's not a fern, it's a yarrow. They don't always put up a stem with a flower on it every year. So sometimes they'll go all year just with their, their leaves, and they're just drawing nutrients and, and strength, so they'll eventually be able to, to make flowers that next season or the season after that. Um, the Queen Anne's Lace, uh, once it's flowered and the flower has been pollinated, seeds will be able to form, and it forms this wonderful little uh, bird's nest, they call it, or a bird cage, and that's this part right here. So the sides kind of come up and hold a basket of little tiny seeds, which, let's see if I can grab one here, they're pretty small, but they're, they've got little hairs on them, and when an animal comes by, whoops, where did it go? I dropped it. I'll do that again. <laughs> <laughs> so, little tiny seeds. All right. Okay. Little tiny seeds with hairs on them. So, <laughs> I grab one, an animal comes along, and that seed's going to stick to their fur. So, the animal moves the seed uh, along rather than the wind taking the pollen and carrying it somewhere else. So, there are different ways that seeds are dispersed here in the meadow, and I kind of like the Queen Anne's lace. I have to give it a little, little, uh, little applause for, for classiness, you know, and, and how it gets that done. Here we've got a lovely little uh, European native. This is called butter and eggs. It's a cottage plant, uh, something that people would have planted uh, around their home gardens. And just because it's so lovely to look at, <laughs> this is a plant that is uh, related to snapdragons. It's in that family. And it's got this beautiful two-tone yellow and kind of a pale uh, or kind of a yellowish white color. And like snapdragons, you can make them talk. You see if we can get this one here. I can show you. Just like that. <laughs> Just by squeezing the sides. But you can see when I do that how the uh, bees do the same thing. They will push open those uh, petals and go inside to get the pollen that's in there. And then the nectar is going to be back on these tubes, which is way back in the back here. So that's why they have to crawl inside, push their way in get that nectar and crawl back out. But in the meantime, they're gonna get hit with the pollen that's right above them, right there. It's gonna land on their back and when they crawl out. Um, butterflies are also very good with their long tongues at getting back here and getting that nectar way at the back of the flower. That's called a spur. 
All members of the milkweed family are important to one particular butterfly, and I'll bet you know what that is. That's the monarch butterfly, big orange and black one. We'll look for some of those when we're out here today. But their caterpillars feed only on members of the milkweed family. That could be butterfly weed, common milkweed, tall milkweed, milkweed four-leaved milkweed, and a variety of others. But without those particular, that particular family of flowers, you won't have monarch butterflies. That's how specific they are to that particular plant. And that's why this meadow is such as an important spot for monarchs in this part of Virginia, because it has a ton of milkweed, and it's allowed to grow and live out its life and, and uh, go to seed and form big patches. So think about where you live and do you see patches of milkweed where you are? And if not, um, do you see monarch butterflies there? And if not, you can correlate. Well, there's a reason for that. Now, when the flowers bloom, uh, monarch butterflies can sip the nectar from these flowers or a variety of other flowers. The adults don't really uh, care about where they get their nectar from, but the caterpillars will only eat the leaves of members of the milkweed family. So you have to have milkweeds if you're going to have monarchs. We've got a lovely special flower here in the meadow. This is called Canadian Burnett, and it's one of our rare species here in the park. It's rare in the state of Virginia. It only grows in a couple of places, uh, generally in a high elevation, cool area, uh, with a wetland, and that's exactly what the Big Meadow provides. Canadian Burnett, that's a northern plant. It's more at home um, farther north, at northern latitudes from here, so you'll find plenty of it farther north, but in Virginia, pretty, uh, pretty rare. So it's kind of ex uh, exciting to see it bloom here in the meadow. And this one's gonna be about three and a half feet tall, which is a, a proper size for the Canadian Burnett. It's got this lovely, toothbrush kind of head of full of little white flowers and then it's got leaves that are kind of uh, resembling rose uh, leaves but it doesn't have any thorns uh, not a member of the of the rose family this is a plant you can notice these tall ones that are sticking up all through here they are growing in an area of blackberry and it's a thicket it's very hard for deer to get in here to eat them. They like to eat Canadian brunette, which is a problem for them here in the meadow. But here, they're, they're pretty well protected from the deer getting in there unless they really want to go after them. Once, once the plants start to flower, they're usually not as tasty to, to the wildlife. So these ones are probably going to be left alone, but they had a chance to get nice and tall by mixing in with these other, other shrubs and, and, and plants. So the deer couldn't see them and then they couldn't get to them. Now on my right over here um, on the trail, Right next to the trail in the open space is another Canadian Burnett that is only about a foot tall, foot and a half tall, and it's in the open area right here. And this is a strategy that plants like Canadian Burnett use that generally bloom when they're taller. But if they're in an area where they're likely to get browsed, um, they will often bloom at a shorter height, just so they have a chance to bloom before they get eaten. And again, that's a sort of a defense mechanism that a plant has, so that at least it's able to make some seeds um, before it, so it doesn't get really tall like it should, if they're going to grow very short in a place where they're uh, subject to grazing by either wildlife or um, in our uh, uh, private lands by our uh, domestic livestock. Well, here we have some thistle. This looks like a, well, I'm not sure which one, but there's a bunch of different thistles out here in the meadow. <laughs> and um, they've got a beautiful purple flower, very attractive to, to pollinators. And when you look at, this is a member of the composite family. That means they have a lot of flowers in one head. And when you look at a thistle, you're looking at hundreds of flowers. Each one of these, see if we can grab one here for you, is an individual flower like that. So there's the tube part, and there at the base, oops, 
is where the nectar is going to be right there so the insect has to get through there back to here to get the nectar and meantime rub some pollen on their faces or <laughs> their bodies and an exit but there are so many of these little nectar tubes on here that they're a wonderful attraction for butterflies butterflies with their long tongues can get way back there to get that nectar bees will go more for the pollen actually um, on the outside um, and the butterflies go for the nectar at the at the very ends but lots and lots of of nectar in there for those pollinators. Thistles then, when they go to seed, this is a wind-assisted seed dispersal system for this plant. And you'll see behind some of the seeds, well, this is a better shot here, um, have started to um, ripen. And they're attached to a bit of downy fluff, just like dandelion seeds. And you can see the seed right at the base there and then there's the fluffy part and that flowers or the plant's going to just let the wind the wind carry it off see if we can help another one here here we go i think the wind's going to be pretty pretty strong today but here it goes whoa okay so wind assisted plant the other thing you notice that this seed head has been kind of torn apart and that's something that our American goldfinches do. These bright yellow birds with the black wings, they're the last birds to nest here in the Big Meadows area because they love to feed the thistle seeds to their young in the nest. If you've ever had a, a bird feeder at home and you want to have goldfinches or other kinds of finches, you buy thistle seed for them because that's their favorite. So they'll feed that to their young, but they'll also line their nest with the fluff from the seed head. So they're a late nesting bird that's pretty dependent on a particular plant here in the meadow, and that's the thistle. And as I said, we have several different species of thistle here for them to take advantage of. We've got a beautiful butterfly weed here. And this is another member of the milkweed family. You can see the flowers look very similar to the common milkweed flowers that we saw earlier, but they're a beautiful orange color. So same shape, same design, same pollination scheme <laughs> they have, but uh, beautiful orange color and very attractive to butterflies like the pearl crescents that we see that are resting on this plant and, and one that's next to it. We have two of our minis here in the meadow. These are native flowers that are very small. And you might wonder why flowers are different sizes. Well, pollinators come in different sizes. A lot of um, people see bumblebees and honeybees and, and figure that those are the size of pollinators. Butterflies are usually pretty large, but there are some very small butterflies. And most of our native bee species, our solitary bees, are very small and very tiny. So we don't even notice them sometimes, but they depend on very small flowers. So we'll take a look at a couple of these right here. This is the nodding wild onion. And like our onions that you grow in your garden, um, at the very base under the ground, there will be a little bulb uh, that is edible. Um, and then the flowers, very tiny. And you can see how small a pollinator would have to be to get up into those flowers. And next to that is this little one. And this is called wild basil. They've got the leaves that look a lot like the basil that you would use in your kitchen today. And both of these would be used by people who lived here in the mountains a long time ago. Um, today, they're primarily um, used by those pollinators that we talked about. Wild basil is in the mint family. So it's got that typical square stem of the mints and that typical mint looking irregular flower. Now I will say even though these these plants have been used in the past 
um, as edibles by people. We ask you that now this is this is a national park that you leave our plants where you find them um, and not dig them up or harm them in any way. Um, there are certain plants, mainly fruits, nuts, and berries, that you are allowed to uh, pick in in quantities that are only small enough for personal consumption. But we ask you not to go foraging in the park and digging up plants or pulling off leaves uh, or removing flowers or seeds. And that's all to protect those plants so that they have a chance to reproduce if they're annuals to make seeds for next year or if they are perennials to be able to um, regrow from the root system next year and put up new shoots and flowers. We've got a beautiful native flower here. This is called a wild rose. It's a pasture rose is its, is its real name. Five uh, beautiful pink petals, and it's got a nice uh, rosy fragrance to a very mild fragrance. Unlike our hybrid roses that we have in our gardens, those uh, generally came originally hundreds of years ago from wild roses that have five petals. The ones that we have in our gardens have been doubled many times, so there's many more petals than you would have in the wild. But our wild roses, beautiful five petaled, very attractive to pollinators, bees, nice landing pad for bees. And then, once they're successfully pollinated, they will form a fruit called a rose hip. And we have some just starting to form right here on this plant. Oops, there it is right there. You can see where the flower was, where those five sepals are. The flower would have been on top of that with its five petals. Now it's been pollinated, seeds forming at the base, and making this beautiful uh, little fruit called a rose hip. Well, back here we have a very beautiful flower that's a native uh, lily in Shenandoah, and this is called the Turk's Cap Lily. The reason I'm not any closer to it to show it to you is because it's growing in a big patch of blackberries that have brambles with thorns, and I'm not walking in there, and neither is a deer. And that's why that Turk's Cap Lily is standing there, because deer love lilies. And just before they bloom, they're just prime snack material for, for the white-tailed deer. But if they're in a, growing in a place where it's hard for the deer to see them or to get to them, they'll be left alone. And so this one Turk's Cap Lily is standing here in the meadow because the deer couldn't get to it. Blackberries are another wild fruit that's available to our wildlife here in the meadow, and it's uh, fruiting right now. You'll see some of the berries starting out red, and then they'll eventually go to black when they're, they're nice and ripe. Some animals don't wait for them to get all the way ripe. Animals like black bears will eat them no matter what color they are, so maybe they like that little bit of a tang with their, with their fruit. But these are something that our, our birds are going to be, be feeding on, as well as uh, other mammals that uh, will be able to reach them. I'm standing in a large patch of huckleberries here in the big meadow. Huckleberries and blueberries are very similar in size and in taste. Uh, they look a little bit different though. Uh, blueberries, uh, their, their fruits have a powdery coating on it that's called a bloom. And you'll notice if you go to the grocery store and you look at plums, they have the same powdery bloom on them. And it's the kind of thing where if you touch it, it will leave your, your fingerprint on that, on that plum or on the blueberry. Uh, and the blueberries have a, an oval green leaf that's, that's just nice and, and green on both sides. There it goes. <laughs> Huckleberries, on the other hand, are shiny, shinier, darker, almost black in, in, in shape. They don't have that powdery bloom uh, on them. About the same size. The leaf, though, is the way you can tell them apart in the wild. Um, if you look at the underside of the leaf of the 
the huckleberry, it will be very shiny, shimmery, almost like uh, sand grains sparkling in the sunlight. The blueberry leaf doesn't do that underneath, so it's a good way to tell them apart. Otherwise, they taste very similar. The uh, huckleberry is uh, seedier, it's got more of those tiny little seeds in it, but the flavor is very similar. And in Shenandoah National Park, you are allowed to pick and eat fruits, nuts, and berries, and that includes uh, blueberries and huckleberries. But again, just enough for your own personal consumption. Um, we want to make sure that there's a lot of these berries and uh, fruits left for the birds and the uh, other wildlife that uh, depends on them. We're standing in front of what's called a deer exclosure, and this is a fence that was put up specifically to keep deer out. And these are monitored so you can tell what's blooming or growing inside and compare it with what's blooming or growing outside. And that way you can see what effect the grazing animals have on the plant life, the vegetation inside. And one of the things that we discovered was a particular plant called turtlehead, and that's a native plant which is declining in population all through the eastern U.S. because deer love it and they just eat it up. So what we don't find outside of the deer exclosure or anywhere else in the big meadow is turtle head. However, because the deer are kept out of this particular spot, the turtle head is growing in its, um, its regular range, its historic range. Um, and it just shows that one animal can have a, a, a major effect on one particular plant. There's a third part to this uh, food chain that uh, we haven't mentioned yet. The turtle head is the host plant of the Baltimore checker spot butterfly, beautiful black and orange butterfly. And those had not been seen in Shenandoah National Park for many, many years. Remember, they have to have turtle head. That's what their caterpillars feed on. Remember the monarchs and how they need to have milkweed uh, plants to chew and to, to eat, and that's what the caterpillars feed on, nothing else. Without milkweed, no monarchs. Without turtle head, you don't have Baltimore checker spots. And so, apparently there hasn't been a lot of turtle head uh, available to Baltimore checker spots over the years. Several years ago, we discovered adult Baltimore checker spots right here in the big meadow, traced back to this deer exclosure and this population of turtle heads. And this is where those checker spots were laying their eggs that would then feed on the turtle head leaves and then over winter in the caterpillar stage, come out in the spring and eventually emerge as adults. If the deer are kept away from the turtle head, then the Baltimore checker spot has a chance to thrive. And that's what we've learned, one of the things we've learned through our deer exclosures here in the park.
Thank you for joining me today as we explored the big meadow here in Shenandoah National Park. I hope you got a chance to come out and see for yourself the amazing diversity of plant life that we have here in Shenandoah National Park, as well as the interactions between pollinators, uh, birds, plants, and uh, all of those things that are connected, all of those things that our national parks protect. So until next time, this is Ranger Mara at Shenandoah National Park.